Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session here in Lecture Hall C at, uh, at Nessus. Uh, my name is Devin Pluler. I, I run the analytics department for Toronto FC, and I am introducing the uh, session this afternoon call, uh, on the topic of unsupervised analysis of tracking data, um, which I think is really a, a super exciting, uh, kind of in the, in the club theater in particular, because it, it really kind of helps bridge the, the gap between the, the spreadsheets and the, and the tactics. Uh, so the, the first talk, um, is uh, Dr. Laurie, uh, Laurie Shaw. Uh, he's a visiting scholar at Harvard Sports Analytics Lab and a fellow of the Harvard Data Science Initiative. He holds a PhD in computa on computational physics, uh, astrophysics, and has previously worked in quantitative finance uh, and for the British government. His research currently focuses on soccer analytics, applying statistical and machine learning techniques to extract information for tracking, uh, from uh, tracking and event data. So welcome, Laurie. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to present some uh, first, first results from a, a new project that we've been working on uh, at the Sports Analytics Lab uh, here at Harvard. So the goal of this project is to, to use tracking and event data to infer and evaluate uh, team strategy in soccer. And, and by that, I mean the, the set of instructions that a manager gives his team both as a group and a set of individuals. The first, um, the first step in this project was to consider team formations. So I'm gonna present a, uh, a data-driven approach for measuring and classifying team formations, analyzing their defensive and offensive configurations for each team uh, separately, and for dynamically detecting changes in formations uh, throughout the course of a match. Um, so I'll start off by uh, presenting some of the methodology and then using a large sample of uh, tracking data from an elite professional league uh, present some of, the, uh, some of the results that we have. So, of course, a team's formation um, in soccer indicates where each player uh, should position themselves on the field. And um, the choice of formation uh, is one of the most important uh, tactical decisions that a manager must make uh, on game day. It defines player roles, how they interact with each other, and um, influences the playing style of, of both teams. So on the left-hand side here, I've, um, I've plotted what I believe is the first ever record of a team, team formations in a, in a soccer match. It's for the, uh, the Scotland versus England game in, uh, in 1872. Um, so England played with uh, an adventurous 1-2-7 formation. So that means, in modern parlance, they, they started with one defender, two midfielders, and seven forwards, while Scotland played with a, uh, a more conservative 2-2-6 uh, formation. And miraculously, this game finished 0-0. <laughs> so obviously, uh, tactics have moved on in the, uh, in the last 150 years. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but we still when discussing formations, still often refer to, um, discuss them in the, uh, in the sort of the, the nomenclature of number of defenders, number of midfielders, and uh, a number of forwards, which is really a very crude way of, um, which is, I'll let you turn that off. Which is very, really a very crude way of, um, of presenting or talking about formations that are loft, often much more, um, uh, fluid and dynamic and nuanced, and can depend very sensitively on, on game state. Here's a quote from the, uh, the Liverpool manager, uh, Jurgen Klopp. You need to create a formation for defending where everybody knows what to do. Uh, and for offensive things, you need to find a formation where everyone, where they really are in their best area on the pitch. Uh, and we can do that in different ways, obviously. So, so clearly what what Jurgen Klopp is saying here is that they use different formations um, at, the, uh, at the sort of the most basic level. They use different formations when they're defending and different formations when they're attacking, and it's probably a lot more detailed than that. So this project has four objectives. Um, the first is to measure team formations in and out of possession um, throughout the course of a match, identify unique formation types from a large sample of tracking data, to dynamically classify formations uh, throughout the course of a match, which would then enable us to detect formation changes. Uh, and finally, to understand um, the connection between formation choice and the playing style of a, te uh, of a team. And um, there's also, I should point out, there's uh, related work here in this area by uh, Alina Bielkowski and uh, collaborators. 
So, as I'm sure everyone here knows, um, in soccer, teams tend to occupy only a fraction of the playing surface at any given moment. Um, so I've plotted four sort of frame instances uh, from a match. This is real data. I've plotted only the, um, the, uh, the defending, the outfield players for the defending team only. Um, and what you can see is that, you know, whilst the team itself, you know, moves around different areas of pitch, they tend to retain their shape or relative player positioning. So in our method for measuring team formations, the insight is really that formations are not defined by the positions of each player on the pitch. They're defined by their positions relative to one another. And so when we, when we measure formations, we do so by calculating the vectors between players and averaging these vectors over, over some window of time. So here, what I've done is, uh, again, this is real data. I've plotted um, the, in, the positions of players at a given instance and the vectors between player six and the, uh, the three surrounding players. Here's the same thing a little bit time later. Obviously, the players have moved, and again, I've marked the vectors uh, between the same four players. And then over some average, over some uh, period of time, we can calculate the average vector between uh, each pair of players and use that to, um, to construct a lattice. Um, that defines the, uh, their average positions relative to one another and essentially defines their formation. And throughout, what I'm going to do is um, translate the center of mass of the formation to the center of the pitch. So as I said at the outset, I mean, what, one of the objectives of this work is to consider uh, formations in different game states, and in this case specifically to consider um, the formations that teams use uh, in and, and out, of the, out of possession of the ball separately. Now, obviously one of the problems in soccer is that possession is exchanged very rapidly between the two teams. So roughly 50% of possessions uh, last less than five seconds. So to identify offensive uh, and defensive formations throughout a match, we aggregate together consecutive periods of possession uh, of the ball for each team into two minute aggregated possession windows. Um, so this plot here shows the first 15 or so minutes of a match, and the red shaded regions indicate the periods in which the, uh, the red team were in possession of the ball, and the blue shaded regions indicate the periods in which the, um, the blue team were in possession of the ball. And so we aggregate these together um, to gain an estimate of for the uh, formation of the team in possession and correspondingly the team that was out of possession um, in that window. And we do so by rolling the, win the, um, the window forward with no overlap. We have a number of extra data selection criteria. Um, we only include possessions that are greater than or equal to five seconds or start with a dead ball situation. And so the purpose of this is to, um, to remove those periods where the ball is just being exchanged very, very rapidly between the two teams and neither of them are able to kind of really adopt a, an offensive or a defensive stance. Um, if a substitution occurs, we end the window. Clearly, if a substitution occurs, that may also indicate a change in formation, uh, and we always ignore the goalkeeper. And so typically, for a given match, this produces an average of 10 defensive formation observations and 10 offensive formation uh, observations for each team. And so this is just an example of um, some formation observations. And you can see that they, uh, we get very kind of realistic looking uh, uh, results. So the top two um, plots here show examples of uh, measured formations. Um, when a team is out of possession. So here you can clearly see what would be a classic 4-4-2. I'm always assuming here that the teams are playing from right to left. Um, here you have you know, three defenders, um, what looks like five midfielders, and two forwards. And then at the bottom we have um, observations of formations when the team is in possession. Um, so in this case you have two sort of central, defender, uh, two central defenders, the fullbacks are pushed up, and you have a holding central midfielder. Um, but in all cases you get you know, very reasonable looking results. Here's um, a set of formation observations throughout the course of an entire match uh, for a, a specific team um, in these two-minute aggregated possession windows. Um, and you can see here, so this is on the left-hand side, this is out of possession. Um, this is on the right-hand side, it's the formation they adopted when they were in possession. Um, so you can see, first of all, there's no indication that this team changed formation throughout a match. They played with four defenders, a uh, central defensive midfielder, four more advanced midfielders, and a forward. Um, and then when they're in possession, you can see the fullbacks pushed up and the wide midfielders pushed up to form a, form a, front, a front three. Um, it's pretty clear, as you'd expect, that the defensive formation is much more compact. Uh, the ratio of the convex holes here was about um, 0.5. 
Uh, and one other thing to notice here is that it's clear that the distribution of the, uh, the forward players were, it was much more broad than that of the defenders. So the defensive players tend to sort of retain their relative positioning, so even, in, in, even when um, in possession of the ball, much more strictly than the, um, the, uh, the forward players. OK, so in the first part, I presented a, uh, a method, a simple method for measuring um, team formations in aggregated possession windows um, using their relative positioning. Um, in the next step, um, I'm going to use a, a large sample, training sample of uh, tracking data um, to try to identify the unique set of uh, formations that teams adopted um, in that training sample. Um, and then in the final section, I'm going to introduce a classification scheme that we use such that we can um, try to classify um, formation observations according to that unique set um, for, uh, for any particular game, thus producing sort of strategic match summaries and being able to study changes in formation. Um, our training set contains uh, 100 matches from an elite professional league. Um, from which we obtain nearly uh, 4,000 formation observations. Half for teams um, when they were out of possession of the ball or when they were defending, and half for teams when they were in possession of the ball, um, so when they were attacking. And so the first thing we need to do if you want to group together similar formations is define a metric for assessing the similarity of formations. Um, so the question that kind of we're really asking here is that, you know, imagine that we have this formation observation here. Can we develop a metric that tells us um, how similar this is to the, um, you know, the three examples on the right. Uh, one thing I'll add here is that I've clearly added these sort of ellipses to the plot here. So as well as measuring their average position in our formation observations, we also measure how far they tend to deviate from that position. And so the ellipses always indicate the, the sort of one sigma or the 68% confidence region around those average positions. So we answer this similarity question using uh, the Vossistine metric. Um, so in the case of uh, two normal distributions, uh, two, two bivariate normal distributions, um, each with their own mean and covariance matrix, um, the Vossistine metric is um, given by uh, this equation here. So it's the sum of the, um, the L2 norm um, um, of the difference in the, uh, the means plus the trace of uh, some combination of the, uh, the covariance matrices. So in the kind of trivial case when we're dealing with point masses, the covariance matrices disappear and you just end up with the, um, what you'd, as you'd expect, the L2 norm. And sort of more generally, um, intuitively speaking, uh, the Vossstein metric can be thought of in the following way. So if you imagine a bivariate distribution as being like a, um, a pile of dirt, where the height of the pile of dirt is proportional to the probability density, um, then essentially the Vossstein metric measures the, uh, the cost or the amount of effort it would take to move that pile of dirt so it should lines up with some other pile of dirt or some other bivariate distribution. Um, and so when we're comparing two observations, uh, we essentially treat it as an optimization problem. So what is the minimum cost of moving from one formation to another? And the reason why it's an optimization problem is you also have to solve the pair, pairwise problem of figuring out which player in one observation is paired with a, a player in the other uh, formation observation. The smaller the cost, of course, the more similar the formations. So one additional extension we add to this um, is to deal with the fact that two formations can be identical in shape, but you know, some can be more compact than the other. And the goal of this is to, sort, is to identify um, unique types of formations according to their, to their shape, um, removing the effects of, of uh, sort of more compact or more expanded formations of the same type. And so to deal with this, we introduce a scaling, uh, a variable scaling factor K that essentially expands or contracts uh, a formation around its center of mass. And so when we're comparing two formations, we search for this K that minimizes the Vossstein distance between those two formations. So essentially scaling out or removing the, or projecting out the, uh, the effect of scale size on the formations. Okay, so in order to identify the unique set of formations, we use agglomerative hierarchical clustering. Um, and so, you know, this process sort of follows this, uh, this algorithm. Uh, we find in our, in our training sample of 4,000 formation observations, which could be on the ball or off the ball, uh, we find the two most similar formation observations um, as dictated by the Vossstein metric and combine them to form a group. We find the next two most similar and combine them uh, and repeat this process. And of course, eventually you begin to, um, 
to combine groups building up a hierarchy. And so, of course, you can plot the results of this process as a, as a dendrogram. So along the bottom, we have our 4,000 individual formation observations from 100 matches, which could be offensive or defensive formation observations. And we gradually combine them until they're all combined at the top. And so this process of uh, the hierarchical clustering indicates that there are essentially five groups of formations um, in our training sample. Uh, and further visual inspection indicates that, that within each group, there are approximately four variants. So essentially producing 20 unique clusters or 20 unique um, formations. And so now let's look through each of these groups in turn. Um, so group one, it's clusters one to four. Um, make up 17% of the sample, and they're pretty clearly formations that have five defenders, uh, two, three, or four uh, midfield players, and one or two forward players. These contain mostly, um, these clusters mostly contain observations of defensive formations, so teams when they're out of possession of the ball. Moving on, uh, group two, clusters five to eight, you can see we've now shifted to four at the back. Um, often they have a quite uh, condensed uh, midfield. Um, and these tend to be a bit more of a mix of offensive and defensive formation observations. Group three, um, clusters nine to 12. I mean, these are pretty clearly, on the first two are a classic four, three, three formations. I mean, I guess you could call this a midfield diamond, but I'm gonna refer to it as a four, three, three. Uh, and a kind of more offensive version of that. Uh, a four, one, four, one with a holding um, midfielder and then your classic four, four, two. And the vast majority of the uh, observations that went into this this, this group came from uh, uh, defensive formation observations. Moving on again, um, group four. Um, so now you can see we've moved on to basically three defenders, um, two typically uh, um, very wide wi um, wing backs, and then different configurations of midfielders and, uh, and forwards. And these are almost entirely observations of uh, offensive formations. And then group five, um, it, I mean, you could refer to these as having two central defenders and then different variants on you know, which players are providing width. So it could be the fullbacks or it could be um, wide midfielders. And these are almost entirely, uh, again, observations of offensive formations. So here's all the, um, all the, uh, the sort of the unique set that we identify in this clustering process. And we've played quite a lot with sort of different cutoff values in the dendrogram and, and trying to understand whether we may be missing some at lower levels or uh, whether they can be ag aggregated together at higher levels. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the take-home points from this is that the, the hierarchical clustering is quite efficient at separating offensive and defensive formation observations, even though we've taken out or scaled out the effect of um, the compactness of the, uh, the formations. Um, so you can see here on the left-hand side of the uh, dendrogram, they were predominantly um, observations of defensive formations. Towards the center, they were more mixed, and on the right-hand side, they were much more offensive. Okay, so now on to some, um, some, some further results. Um, so we've identified 20 unique formation uh, clusters from 4,000 observations in our training set. Um, we also developed um, and have applied a Bayesian selection um, algorithm to identify the maximum likelihood uh, cluster for any given formation observation. So essentially, given a formation observation, what's the probability it was drawn from each of those 20 uh, unique clusters? Uh, and this enables us to, uh, to create tactical summaries of each match and, and also to uh, detect changes in formation and put you know, a statistical significance on those changes of formation. So what I'm gonna do now in the last part of the talk is apply um, this to a larger sample of 200 matches uh, with tracking data and study some of the results. So one of the first questions you might ask are, which defensive and offensive formation observations are most frequently paired together? So essentially, like how do teams transition from their defensive stance when they're out of possession of the ball to their offensive stance when they're in possession of the ball? And so this Sankey diagram indicates the sort of the most frequent pairings um, that we observe in our data. So on the left-hand side, you have so the defensive uh, clusters when teams are out of possession, and on the right-hand side, you have offensive clusters when they're in possession, and the numbers refer to the, uh, the cluster number. So for example, um, here's uh, cluster two, and teams that defend or have defensive formation observations that are drawn from a cluster two tend to have offensive formations that are drawn from cluster 16. Um, and you can see here there's a pretty clear story. I mean, the, the sort of the, the wide defenders would push up um, the, uh, the holding midfielder sort of largely stays put, 
and the two midfielders on each of the side of them, when they gain possession of the ball, tend to tuck in behind the two, uh, the two forwards. But not all um, clusters have a unique one-to-one -one mapping. Um, so, for example, we find that teams that typically defend with uh, this 4-3-3 can transition into either cluster 10, where effectively the two, um, the, the two outside forwards tend to push wide, um, and the two um, outside midfielders tend to tuck in behind them, or um, into cluster 18. So the, uh, the full backs are here, they're providing the width, and the three central forwards remain fairly narrow. So I think there's kind of two points here to take home. One is that you can see kind of a pretty clear story of how teams would transition from defense to attack, and that's important um, because otherwise, you know, if you couldn't see how players would move when they gain possession of the ball, that would be worrying. And the second thing, of course, is that a team can have one um, defensive formation but can transition into several different options, and we see that um, throughout the data set. Okay, so I mentioned at the beginning, one of the things that this allows us to do is create sort of strategic summaries uh, of a match. Um, so what I'm here, I'm plotting a um, one such match summary. Um, it's a match between, I'm gonna refer to them as the red team and the blue team. Um, so the circles indicate um, the classifications of formation observations when teams are in possession of the ball. Uh, and the diamonds indicate the formation classifications when uh, teams are out of possession of the ball when, or when they're defending. So for example, the blue team here start the match um, in formation cluster 10, which is um, uh, essentially a 4-3-3 um, when they're in possession and uh, formation cluster nine when they're defending, which is also a, a, a sort of defensive variant of a 4-3-3. But the main thing is here, you can see that they pretty clearly uh, and with high significance made a tactical change in the last 10 minutes of the game. Um, so one of the things our algorithm allows us to do is then kind of try to study these in a bit more detail. Here's another example. Um, so in this game, the, uh, the story of this game is that the red team go a goal down uh, quite early on. Um, they make a, uh, a, a major tactical shift at half time and also a, a substitution, essentially switching from sort of three central defenders to, uh, to four central defenders. Um, they, uh, they get a goal back. Um, shortly after half time, but then uh, concede two further, two more. And so it's actually, it's quite interesting to, uh, to study some of these formation changes in more detail and try to understand and see if you can find patterns and try to understand what's going on. And the red team that I showed in the previous slide in particular are quite interesting because they quite frequently made the same formation change uh, or similar formation change between sort of one or two formations. Um, in, uh, in around a quarter of their matches. So here's another one of their matches. They, here they were playing one of the best teams in the league. And again, they make a, uh, a, a formation change at half time that's also accompanied by a, a substitution. Um, and they go on to draw this, this game nil-nil. And so what I want to do in the last part of this, um, of this presentation is just to look at a little bit more detail as to can we try to understand why they made this formation change and what was the potential impact of it um, uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the second half of the game. So what I'm showing here now is this is the, the actual observation of their formation um, at, uh, at just before half time. Um, and on the left hand side, I'm plotting the a pass and shot map of their opponents, the blue team. So the red team are shooting from right to left and here the, the blue team are shooting from left to right. Um, so the arrows indicate each of their passes, the start and end location um, uh, in the first half. And then the dots indicate the shot locations with the size of the dot indicating the quality of the opportunity. And so what you can see is that this team tended to sort of attack down the, uh, the wings and, uh, and then try to play crosses into the, into the box and, and sort of mostly down the, uh, the right-hand side. But they didn't really play so many passes directly through um, the center of midfield. Uh, and indeed, these three sort of big chances they created here, which they didn't score, um, all came from crosses. In the second half, so the red team made a, a formation change. They actually removed this, um, this central striker. Um, they pulled the, uh, one of the, the uh, midfielders forward into that position, um, and they brought on an extra a central defender. Uh, and actually, the sort of play, they also switched, the, um, switched the, uh, the sides of their two outside forwards, and that's something that we see very regularly um, in, the, uh, in the data for this team when they made formation changes. And you can see the pass map here has also changed somewhat. Um, so they're now no longer 
um, quite so many passes down the, uh, down the wing of the, uh, down the side of the field by the blue team and you know, correspondingly fewer crosses into the box. Um, but there are also more passes through the center of the field and more chances created from, from those passes. Uh, and it's actually interesting to kind of look at the velocity structure of the players as well. What we found is that um, the, the, these two defensive, these two outside defenders, the, uh, the wing backs, um, their velocity vectors were much more correlated with their opposing numbers in the, uh, in the second half of the game, which indicates they've been instructed to man-mark those players. Okay, so just um, to finish, uh, a summary of the, uh, uh, of the main, main points of this presentation. Uh, so we've presented a methodology to measure team formations in and out of possession based on player positions relative to, uh, to nearby players in the same team. Um, Using agglomerative hierarchical clustering, we identified 20 unique formations used by the teams in our sample of 100 training matches, and then um, applied an algorithm for dynamically classifying uh, formations and detecting changes in formation, uh, and applied that to a much larger sample of 200 matches. Um, we studied pairings of offensive and defensive formations and dem demonstrated the consistency of transitions, and then finally I presented a sort of short case study of the um, of the impact of formation changes uh, on match events. And it's this last area that we're planning to do um, a, a lot more work in the, uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. We've got uh, time for one or two questions. So formations depend mainly on uh, position type, right? But within maybe the same position type, these formation probably uh, depend on ball location as well, right? Did you try to incorporate any kind of the location, ball location into these analysis? So you're asking, did the formation depend on sort of how far advanced up the team, up the field the teams were? The location of the ball, let's say oh, I, I uh, we are attacking and ball is in our own field, own half. So my formation should be different than when the ball is in the offensive side, right? Yeah, so actually, I mean, one of the extensions we're making to this work is rather than just to con sort of consider in possession and out of possession, consider different phases of possession. So like teams often talk about transition when they've just won back ball, possession of the ball, establishing possession, progressing it up the field and creating opportunities. And ideally what we want to break down is, is break down um, the game more finely into those phases uh, and for defending also a high press and a low press, and to study the formations uh, in even more detail. Uh, one more. Hi, thanks, Laurie, super interesting. If I understood uh, correctly, you filter out initially all these uh, scenes where the ball is flipping around, like five seconds with team A and then another five seconds team B. Have you considered using these filtered data to identify and quantify something like the wildness of the press of some teams? Um, yeah, I mean, we'd love to do that. Again, it's sort of similar to the previous question. Um, trying to study transitions seems to be a thing in its own, you know, in its own right, and um, sort of to consider, you know, are the team, when they're defending, are they playing with a high press, and what are the players doing there is, uh, is obviously very different to what they're doing when they're defending deeply. And you know, actually, you know, one of the things we're adding to this is to consider the full phase space. So rather than just considering uh, positions, also consider velocity structure in the um, in the um, in the uh, in the clustering as well. Let's uh, thank Laurie one more time.